Hey, welcome back to The Urban Monk. Dr. Pedram Shojai here with Tom Zaki, who is one of uh, my favorite people I met this summer uh, filming the, or uh, the the Prosperity movie. Sorry, I got all my movies uh, blended at this point. And so we were on this long journey trying to look at what the challenges we have as a culture are with waste. And uh, we found TerraCycle. And this is a company that he founded some years back, and it really had to do with uh, uh, addressing this waste issue and really going after it in a way that's going to be productive and not small scale. Uh, and he works with companies uh, that are very big and uh, you know are really interested in making uh, a difference. And we're going to talk about why that is and how he goes about doing it because really you know the world needs more uh, more solutions right now. I just read a story uh, about how in the Marianas Trench they're finding all sorts of trash. And so it's like there's nowhere to hide. The garbage is getting deposited everywhere. And uh, really, the, the, the question is, what do we do with so much stuff? Because there's too much stuff. Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So you got a map of the world behind you, and it's made out of, is that cork? <laughs> These are wine corks. We're actually um, the world's biggest collector and recycler of wine corks. Uh, this just happens to be, uh, I mean, uh, all of our conference rooms are literally upcycled. Uh, and I just happen to be in the one that's our travel room. And uh, so there's a lot of fun sort of things made from garbage. This just happens to be a, a world map. But um, if you came to our offices, we're headquartered in Trent, New Jersey. Literally every detail of, uh, of all of our spaces around the world are made entirely from waste, um, including where I'm sitting right now. So. Let's back into your story real quick because you got into this. Uh, you know, you're a smart guy going to school. You found a problem, a big world problem, and you said, "You know what? I can't ignore this." And you got into this concept. How? Well, so yeah, I was a, 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 a an undergrad student, and I was really thinking about. Well, very first student, I've, I've always enjoyed entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is amazing because you can really influence the world quickly. Globally, I mean, TerraCycle operates now in 21 countries around the world, from Australia to China, of course, the U.S. and many others. Um, but the question that was really in my mind was that what they teach us in school is that the purpose of business is profit, 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 profit. And I think profit's very important, but I think the thing I was debating in my mind was that what's the real purpose of business? Why do employees come to work? Why do vendors and customers partner with one? I think it's probably around what does the business do? What is its purpose? Uh, what service does it provide? What product does it make? And uh, in that mode, we were thinking about, you know, my friends and I sort of, what's a big problem? Garbage is, a, is one of many, many big problems, but it's a gargantuan issue. And so the concept of TerraCycle came up by trying to create a, a social business, a for-profit business, but whose purpose was to solve waste and ideally do that profitably. And uh, that was uh, now about 13, well, the idea was 15 years ago. I ended up leaving school about 13 years ago. And luckily, knock on wood, we've uh, expanded and grown every year since then, trying to effectively eliminate the idea of waste by collecting and recycling anything that can't be recycled today, and then integrating more recycled materials in our normal day-to-day -day products and trying to make everything effectively much more circular instead of very linear, which is the world we live in today. So there's a few ways we deal with waste currently. And um, some of them are better than others. Uh, I think, you know, I remember, you know, from the, the movie interview, I think you had mentioned five. I'd love to kind of yeah. tease that out here. Yeah, absolutely. There are effectively five things uh, that you can do with waste. Now, the very worst thing, it's not even in the realm of the five, is littering. Just throw it on the ground. And that may seem like, who does that? But 25% of the waste in the world is littered and ends up in our marine systems, in our oceans, our rivers, especially uh, uh, in the five major gyres. So still 25% of the world's waste is littered. That doesn't even count as in the first five. So the, so the worst thing to do when you call proper waste management would be landfilling, basically put in a big pile. That's still the most common solution in the world. Very trendy in the Americas, a little less trendy in Europe and uh, wealthy Asian markets like Japan or South Korea, but overall the world's most popular choice. And that's, you know, it, it's, it's not a positive thing. It's basically putting all this valuable material in a big pile, and that's that. Better than incineration, sorry, better than landfilling, but still uh, linear, uh, you're destroying the waste, is burning the waste, ideally with some energy recovery. That's called incineration or waste to energy or energy conversion. Those are all synonyms. 
And it's basically you put it into a big incinerator, a big fire, and uh, uh, if it has more energy, more caloric value uh, 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 get, uh, that comes out than you put in, then you make energy. The challenge with incineration is, again, you're destroying the waste. And the things that are very difficult to recycle uh, actually burn at negative energy value, which means you have to put more energy in than you get out. And ironically, the things that are the most recyclable, like a PET bottle, which is like a soda bottle, are the ones that actually burn a positive energy. So that's, you know, that's more popular now in countries like Germany, Japan, but still something that destroys waste. The circular solution, solutions that allow you to go around over and over, so the next best is recycling. Recycling is where if you take something like, uh, uh, you know, say a juice pouch, like a Capri Sun pouch, recycling it is where you melt it all together and make a plastic or something from it and then turn that into a new product. Um, uh, that's about, you know, the vast majority of what we do uh, is recycle things that are not typically recyclable, everything from cigarette butts to dirty diapers and many things in between. Now, above recycling is upcycling. Upcycling is where you take that same juice pouch, but instead of destroying its form and function, you value the, the, uh, the composition, what it's made from, and its form, and you take that pouch and you sew it together into, say, a backpack or something like that, or taking wine corks and making the thing you see behind me. That's upcycling. Recycling these wine corks would be shredding them and maybe making it into a sole of a sandal or something. Mm -hmm. So upcycling is super exciting and sexy and has a lot of visibility, but it's low volume. And then above upcycling is reuse, where you basically value that object for exactly what it was intended for and basically clean it, fix it, and sell it again. We do a lot in that in clothing, toys, electronics, and some simple shaped uh, items. Those are what you can do now. I just want to mention that none of those are the answer to waste mm -hmm. at all. Those are solutions to a problem. But the way to get away from even having the problem is actually above all that, which is how do you buy things differently? Yep. So instead of buying tons of disposable stuff that's just going to break super fast or have very short lifetimes, I, you know, I would encourage people to think about buying consciously. That just simply means knowing that everything you buy will be waste and then buying according to that thought process. Better than that would be buying durable instead of disposable. And better than buying durable is buying used because if it is durable, it ought to be available used. And then the actual answer to all environmental problems, whether you care about the fish in the ocean, garbage, air quality, water quality, you name it, stop buying. <laughs> and you've solved every problem in the world. That's so terrible for the economy. It's, you know, so, so when 9-11 happens, right, George Bush comes on and says, don't stop shopping, right? Because yeah. everything in our economy is built around consumption of goods. And so it's like the whole, the whole thing is, is, is designed around us buying things that are unsustainably built and keep filling up landfills and choking out the planet. You're, you're right. I just want to echo that, though. It's not necessarily the, the nail in the economic coffin, if you will. Because if you don't buy a bunch of stuff, you can spend that money on going to the theater, mm -hmm. watching a movie, mm -hmm. experiencing things. Getting a massage. Right? <laughs> or, or getting the idea of something but not buying that said object. So you can still really fuel the economy without a bunch of disposable stuff. Mm -hmm. So that puts you in a bit of a pickle because you work with some of the biggest uh, consumer goods pro uh, product companies in the world and they're, you know, they're loving working with you because you make them look good and you're helping them be better, you know, corporate global citizens. But at the same time you're telling them, you're telling people to stop buying stuff. So it's an, yeah. it's an interesting dilemma, right? It's an interesting place we sit in, in the world and, 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 you know, looking at the problems down the barrel here. Well, it's interesting, yeah, and, and, you're at, and what we've done actually with a lot of our partners is we frame our model in sort of three things we do. The first thing we want to do with a partner is move away from linear systems to at least collect and recycle that object. So take something as simple as a toothpaste tube. Toothpaste tubes today are not recyclable anywhere in the world. So the first step in working with a company like Colgate in that example, which is the biggest in the space, is at least let's figure out a way to collect and recycle all the toothpaste tubes out there. That's step one. And yes, what's the value for them there is then they can now claim that their product is recyclable, it makes them better, and, uh, and, and, and they can win from that. That's stage one. And we do that with hundreds and hundreds of consumer product companies all around the world, uh, retailers and so on. Once that is done, the next thing we start working on with companies, and it's really always the second step, is how do we integrate more recycled materials into their products? A big landmark announcement we just had literally three weeks ago at the World Economic Forum in Davos was we announced with P&G, which is the world's largest consumer product company, 
um, the uh, biggest deployment of ocean plastic ever in history. Uh, and we did that by making the Head and Shoulders shampoo bottle, which is the number one shampoo brand in the world, 25% out of marine plastic. Wow. And there, uh, it's uh, massive in scale, huge solution to, uh, to uh, ocean plastic, and it's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, and that's the second phase. And we do this with lots of companies. How do we integrate garbage back into their systems? But then there's the third step. And uh, we're going to be launching this actually with a couple of partners uh, 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 in about a year or two, which is coming up with ways where we could redesign their products to be fundamentally durable and move away from the idea of disposability overall. And what we want to try to do is take our partners and move along these, these spectrum where at the end we wake up, and it's not about just collecting and recycling their stuff, it's about moving away from the concept of garbage overall. But it's this progression. You can't do one until you do, you know, you have to do it step by step by step. And that's what we're taking companies on a journey on. And as long as you can show value along the way and not make them feel like they're gonna become irrelevant uh, or their business will suffer, then you can really unlock some major magic and do it at monster scale on a global basis. I, I love the incremental change, kind of behavior change model that you're following here. Is you know we could talk about you know gold standard and uh, never get anything done, or we can get yeah. in, roll up our sleeves, and just start working. And so you know, what, what, like 15 years from now, you can ima imagine a world where your countertop in your bathroom has a place where toothpaste gets deposited from a fabricator and you know Procter and Gamble or whoever it is basically just you know has the IP and, and, and sends the chemical equivalent of the toothpaste I mean who knows right but but you don't have to ship it in plastic anymore well and you nailed it and that is actually not a un, what you just described is actually plausible but the only way to get someone like a you know in a case of coal, you know toothpaste say a Colgate to get there is to show small step wins along the way because one of the challenges with sustainability Especially if you're trying to motivate an organization, whether it's a big retailer or a consumer product company, but whether it's just a local government group or anyone, even like the business you're in. If you make the topic too big, too hairy, too far away, people will get excited and won't action. Mm -hmm. The key is to do small digestible steps and make sure you celebrate and win every step of the way. So mm -hmm. to give you an example, when we launched this uh, ocean plastic bottle with Head & Shoulders, what it did is it suddenly woke up the entire community of consumer product companies and said, this is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of phone calls we've been getting from competitors to Procter & Gamble and even internally different divisions of, of, of P&G about how do we now replicate this and make this even bigger is phenomenal. But the only way that happened is by proving it in one country, you know, with one brand and creating victory and then growing it from there. And that's really important as you think about creating any environmental movement is making it digestible because sometimes social and environmental movements are so gargantuan and dealing with such big issues, people feel there's not much we can do. And this is critical in, in environment and sustainability is if you look at a lot of, you know, movies like Inconvenient Truth, you know, one of the most cornerstone environmental documentaries, one of some of the challenges is that it, it accurately dis portrays how bad everything is, is right now from an environmental point of view, and it leaves you with very little you can do. And then you get educated, but you also feel unempowered to make change, and what will you do? Do nothing. You'll be more educated, but you won't action. And we need people to action, and the way to action is to make it from positive, get people to smile. I mean, we have our own TV show. Uh, uh, we're now in a fourth season of our own reality show, and uh, it's a comedy. It's supposed to be funny, it's supposed to make you laugh, and then inspire you to take action versus trying to inspire you to take action through negative, yeah. which is sometimes the challenge of uh, a lot of the communication we see in uh, sustainability and environment. Well, and that's a big thing. And so, and you know, a lot of the things I'm seeing shifting in the dynamic, of, especially with dot orgs and all that, is people are asking a bigger question: is what is your theory of change, right? And you know, are you tackling big global problems, and are you trying to just kind of poke at people and give them information, or are you actually creating some sort of radical, transformative vehicle for things to happen and behavior to change? So, for me, if I'm using Head and Shoulders, all I have to do is continue to use Head and Shoulders, and suddenly I'm taking out the Pacific Gyre or whatever, or whatever. Yeah. You guys are drawing the plastic, which makes it super yeah. easy. Well, then that's the key, you know, like our message here on that. And that's one of hundreds of examples. But the message there is you can help be a part of a movement you never thought you could be a part of a by buying that product instead of a different shampoo. B, by recycling it so it doesn't end up back in the system, because that's the important thing. You don't want to just get it out once and then throw it back in the ocean. And the third 
is then you can have actually make the bottle by joining your local beach cleanup because this is a constant supply chain where we're now collecting monstrous amounts of material and people can then get involved. You know, what's crazy in today's world, no matter what side of the equation you are politically in the US, we are actually debating global warming. How crazy is that, that, that it's even being debated? And, but it makes sense, it can, can be debated because you know, you, you said you were skiing recently. There's snow on the ground. How can there be snow on the ground when the world is warming? And that complexity is what makes it hard to make it absolute. Garbage is unique in that sense because waste is something that I've never seen debate on. I've never met a human being, whether they're right wing, left wing, old, young, male, female, anywhere in the world that says garbage is good and recycling is bad. And there's something simple and that simplicity allows people to take some action. But I think we got to think about that metaphor and bring it to the more complex environmental issues that are not so simple as garbage is good, sorry, garbage is bad and recycling is good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, so last, you know, originally maybe like three, four years ago, people were talking about this, this gyre of plastic in the middle of the Pacific being the size of the state of Texas. And last I heard it might be, you know, the, the size of a lot more than that. How scalable is this? Like how much is head and shoulders um, going to start putting a dent into this? And then how much does this have to like create a, a snowball effect and cascade people from other say products, consumer products companies yeah. to come in and, and, and really you know start taking a big bite out of this thing? It's a great question. I'm gonna try to answer it many different ways. So first, if I answer it from what is the impact of this particular uh, project is it's the biggest solution to ocean plastic to date by volume in any respect percent in the bottle amount of ocean plastic recovered number of bottles made and that set a record just for the French deployment and now we're going to be scaling it up across dozens of countries with other products beyond just uh, head and shoulders it's going to be big that's the good news the bad news is that still 25% of the uh, plastic in the world ends up in our ocean. So this solution is not even, it, it, it's barely, it, it's addressing maybe a percent of what's even being added. Forget what's already there. Because the nature of the problem is so massively big. Now, hopefully what this will do, it won't solve it. Let's just be fair. It's not going to solve it. But maybe it will uh, galvanize enough people, enough companies, retailers to get into it to create even more mass. And we are seeing that play out even in just the TerraCycle ecosystem. And maybe it'll educate people to stop getting all that material in because we have to first stop getting material into the ocean and then we have to clean up the ocean. Mm -hmm. And there's not just one garbage gyre, you know, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that we talk about. Every ocean gyre, of which there are five, is the size of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. <laughs> and the Mediterranean is covered. It's all everywhere, rivers, you know, uh, uh, whether it's uh, the Mississippi all the way to the rivers in Brazil are filled with these materials. So we need, I think it's all about first raising awareness, then showing that we can accomplish massive supply chains and really build a business proposition to sh uh, create the solution. But again, none of these are the fundamental answer. The answer is we have to stop putting this stuff into the ocean to begin with. And only then will the cleanup efforts create incremental value versus just putting a little plug in the faucet that's just you know spilling all this material in constantly. How optimistic are you about us being able to do this fast enough and at scale to really start offsetting some of the, the, the toxic effects of, you know, fish getting, getting you know, um, petrochemicals in their, in their cells and all the things that you read about? They already are. A lot of the sushi and fish that you eat has all these uh, pollutants already in it. And I think to be fair, um, I'm an optimistic by heart, you know, so it's about let's go do this stuff. But I think that the issue that we've created from an environmental point of view, whether it's global warming, whether it's garbage, it's going to hit us in the face real hard soon. It already is to some degree. You know, we're looking at uh, problems like Syria and others. These are environmentally generated issues. And uh, so we're going to have a lot of negative to deal with. But the only way to one day wake up, maybe hundreds of years from now, and wake up in a sustainable planet is to start and create these answers while we deal with the negatives. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, we're, you know, it, it's imagine if you're fighting a terminal disease. We are sick, right, mm -hmm. as people, and we have to accept that. And we're gonna have to deal with the symptoms that come from illness. Mm -hmm. Those, you know, in environment, that's gonna be more natural disasters, rising sea levels, contaminated food supply, 
you name it, you know, dwindling diversity, less animals. And I, you know, I could rattle off all the issues. Those are the symptoms and those are already present and more will occur. Yeah. But we also have to start taking medicine and changing our, it's not even just taking the medicine, it's changing our fundamental habits so that we can become healthy and recover from this. But we have to do both in parallel. Yeah. It's critical to think, you know, to not perceive that everything is okay and, and that we can, you know, these are, you know, we can one day scale these nicely and be okay. We're gonna be, it's not gonna be good, but we have to go through that process. Okay. You know, it's, what you're describing here is actually one of the fundamental distinctions between, say, allopathic medicine and, and a holistic approach where, you know, allopathic medicine is battlefield medicine. And so it's like, oh, hey, I got a cancer diagnosis. Now I go for chemotherapy and, and, and you know, have a very aggressive intervention. Um, and that's all that I need to do versus like, well, let me just, you know, clean up my house and start eating vegetables and all these things that would also be part of shifting the ecosystem uh, to help offset this, right? And, and that's, I think you need both yeah. in this case. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's so bad. You know, we do have that metaphor of cancer right now, and I think we need the chemotherapy, which is, call it, laws that, you know, tax packaging, these sort of projects that we're trying to do to clean up the oceans and, 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 and land-based waste and all that stuff. But we also have to have, be holistic, and we need to stop creating the problem to begin with. Yeah. Right. We can't. It's sort of like even the food issue. You know, if if one's obese, you can't work your way like, you know, you can't like just exercise and exercise and exercise and be healthy and then go and eat all this junk food. We have to exercise and stop eating the bad mm -hmm. food. Mm hmm. Yeah, and stop worrying and all the other things that lead to the mindsets that do that. So, it, it, I mean, it's complicated, uh, but so yeah. are we. And so, yeah. you know, the, the point is there's some incremental change that can be made at every turn. Now, for me, when I hear this as a, as a conscious consumer, I think, you know, well, if I, if I needed uh, sh shampoo, it would be a different, uh, different piece. But you know what? If I'm going to buy shampoo and uh, shampoo is shampoo across the market, then this influences me to go buy head and shoulders because right. now it is supportive of uh, values that I think are important to me. And so to, to me, that, that's a big lever, is then consumers driving other corporations to be like, listen, if you're not yeah. doing marine, marine waste plastic, then what are you doing? Like, why am I buying your stuff? Well, and you nailed it. If you do that, then what, what would it tell the other companies who make shampoo? We have to play in this game or we're gonna be left behind. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of the consumer. I think consumers undervalue their tremendous power because companies are in the business not of giving consumers what they don't want and somehow jamming it down our throats. That's exceptionally difficult. Maybe they invent things that we didn't know we want but want once we see it, anticipate our desires. But the real thing uh, consumer product companies do generally is figure out what we want and give it to us. Mm -hmm. And we need to adjust our desires and watch how quickly the ecosystem uh, will respond. Consumer product companies and retailers are mirrors to our desires. We need to change our desires and vote consciously. You know, we get so hung up about voting with a piece of paper and like a, a pen every four years for basically choosing between A and B. This is an important decision, don't get me wrong, but we get so hung up on it and yet we vote unconsciously with actual money multiple times a day and don't take responsibility over that vote. Yeah. And that vote is critically, critically important. You know, someone told me at a, uh, uh, that if we stop buying, for example, like, take an average product like chewing gum, if the world stopped buying chewing gum, it would take six weeks for the entire global gum industry to disappear. Six weeks. Bam, gone, choke them out. Done. Yeah. They'd be bankrupt, all factories closed, supply chains done, retailers would have delisted them, and it wouldn't exist as an idea anymore. Six weeks to destroy any, or ch it, it, I use the word destroy, but change. Because what would then the companies like Cadbury and Mars do? They wouldn't just you know, close their doors. They'd be like, look, gum is not the business anymore. Let's create something else that consumers want. Move, 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 go agile. Yeah, it's one of the, yeah. it's one of the themes that we're dealing with in, in the movie that you're in is the supply chain dynamics of using shade-grown cacao, shade-grown yerba mate that needs to be grown within a tree canopy. And so there's a couple of companies that we're dealing with. It's like if you buy their products, you're growing the rainforest back versus going yeah. after clear cutting and, and destroying the planet with the, the, the crappy chocolate that you're buying. And well, I want to point out what you're saying there, which is important to any listener, is if whether you are conscious of what you described or not, if you're buying the other stuff, you're actually voting for deforestation and funding it. Yep. Whether you're conscious of it or not, it's you're doing it.
Yeah. And you're funding those companies to have lobbyists that are also lobbying your, uh, your politicians uh, to drive policy and, and drive the world in a direction where, you know, we, we can't come back from, from the edge of that cliff. And so, yeah, sure. it's, it's the most empowering thing anyone watching this needs to know is that, you know, look, we're the ones in the driver's seat. I mean, no one is yeah. putting a gun to your head and saying, swipe your card here. And so you can choose what you're doing. And so, I, okay, so when we're looking at this ecosystem here, and we're running out of time. I know we have a very short amount of time here. Um, recycling is great if you need to do it. Upcycling is great. All these things that are there, is, you know, the linear ones are less good than the circular ones. Um, if I'm listening to this going, look, you know, I got kids, they have, you know, like, you know, the other day I got in this whole thing with my wife. She had, she gets all these like bags for Valentine's Day for all the kids in my kids' class, right? And it's just a bunch of plastic shit. And I'm like, what is this? Yeah. What is yeah. this? I don't, I, you know, let's get them a tree. Like, I, like what, yeah. why are we buying this? And, and so yeah. what does one need to do to really start shifting and thinking differently about that type of consumption? I think it's one simple thing because it's not, what I don't want to say is suddenly become an expert in everything. That's just way too much work. Sure. It's unrealistic, especially when you're busy, you have a family, you know, I, it's very difficult. I think just come up with it's one simple change. Realize everything you buy will be garbage. Hmm. If you're really thinking about waste, or, or maybe even take a take a, a zoom up from that, realize everything you're buying, you are voting for more of that to exist. <laughs> and if you hold that lens, I bet you would make a lot of different decisions quickly, and you don't have to become experts at the product. Hmm. You know, if you're going to go buy a fur jacket, realize that you're just voted for more animals to be butchered for more fur to exist. Almost hmm. think about it like if you buy one, two more will be made. Hmm. And that's the world and, you create. And that's the world you create. And I think if you acknowledge that, it suddenly becomes personal because you can't hide behind. To, like What you can't say is, oh, if I didn't buy that fur jacket, the fur industry would exist anyway. It would. Just two less jackets would exist. Right. Right. And I think that's the, it's a compounding effect, too. That's why I say it's not one for one. It's almost like one for two. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if that's all you take away, I think you will change so much behavior so quickly because you're right. You know, I have a young son and he came home with a bunch of Valentine's Day gifts and they were all shit that we just basically threw out as soon as he walked in. And he's two years old. He doesn't even know what he had. Yep. And the answer was why, you know, what then people just give away flowers that they you know picked in the garden and, uh, and, and something along those lines. And the answer is we need to acknowledge that. I think we will change everything if we just come to terms with that, that we are creating the future and we can't point our finger to big companies. You know, we can't say, hey, the beverage industry, stop giving us sugary soda drinks. And then, you know, I'm drinking my diet soda, right? You know, in, in the next sip, yeah. right? That's, if we acknowledge that everything will change fast and the speed of change will be incredibly quick. <laughs> It's all just a big dream. It's all just one big kind of trance that everyone is under thinking that the problems are bigger than themselves. And that, that to me they're is not. that they're not right. It's, it's every single one of us has that power right here, yes. right now. Yes. And, yeah. and looking at like what makes the economy. So I've been looking, I'm not an economist, so I'm looking at what the economy is all about in the making of this film. And it's really just every single thing that happens in capitalism are these micro decisions that are happening on the consumption level of spending that then in aggregate create the world that we live in. And so every single yeah. one of those units is a consciousness that has a choice in how that money flows, in, you know, mostly out, but in and out of our lives. It does. And it's contagious. If we start making those changes, our friends will take notice, you know, and things will change. I love it. Tom, I love what you're doing. I, the TerraCycle, I'm looking at the, the numbers here. There's about almost 64 million people that are recycling through your programs right now. And I, is that 3.8 billion? There's so much waste being recycled. You guys are donating to charity, but you're a, a small for-profit company using leverage as a business to go out there and use the business as a force for good and, and really uh, change behavior. And, and you're working with the biggest of the big. I mean, you're working with some of the biggest companies out there. So I really, I applaud your efforts and I think that, um, you know, anything we can do to support you, I know we're out of time, but uh, man, I, you know, go get them, man. Keep going. I appreciate it. Right on. Thanks so much. I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, thank you. Let me know what you think. How are you going to get involved? What are you going to do in your life right now, today, with your next decision? And then the decisions going on from there. Really look at the wake you're creating in your life and think, what can I do to make a difference to transform the world around me, starting with 
me, my family, my community from there. Dr. Pedram Shojai, The Urban Monk, I will see you next time. Thank you.